Hi everyone, welcome to our first video lecture. This is part of the first week uh, coverage of pre-Columbian America and the rise of an Atlantic world. And we start today uh, with part one of the lecture, Americas Before Columbus. And I'll go about halfway through this PowerPoint uh, and take a break and then create a second part video lecture covering the second half. So the Americas before Columbus. Here you see the stunning uh, vista of what we call the Pyramid of the Sun uh, in Mexico, uh, modern Mexico, the Pyramid of the Sun, uh, part of what was a great civilization in that region uh, long before the arrival of the Europeans known as Teotihuacan. And, and we'll come back to, uh, to talk a bit about that. Uh, but first, let me introduce uh, what it is we're, uh, we're doing here today uh, with this, uh, this lecture on the Americas before Columbus and, and why it matters. You know, without this chapter, this pre-European chapter in the history of our hemisphere, in the history of our continent, uh, there would be no United States history at all. And, and we need to get our, our minds around that because sometimes we assume that you know really history begins with Columbus and the arrival of Europeans and that somehow before uh, their arrival that the Americas existed as a kind of vast wilderness. But the fact is uh, that if that were true none of the history as we know it could have occurred since simply because 15th century Europeans that is those of Columbus's day lacked the organization tools and economic resources to conquer a wilderness. But you see, that's not what they found in the New World. In truth, environmental engineering in North America had been going on for centuries, even millennia. And instead of a wilderness, Native American peoples had long ago created a hospitable environment into which European crops, animals, and eventually people themselves could be embedded including the history of our own nation. So as I say, without the precursor, without the centuries and even millennia of human activity in the Americas, uh, it's impossible to think that somehow in the age of Columbus, uh, this, uh, you know, this, this great sort of uh, transition in human history uh, could have taken place at all. You know, it's typical also uh, for us to uh, stereotype or condense, you know, the peoples, the native peoples of America into a single Indian type, you know, the teepee dwelling, buffalo hunting type. And certainly that would be appropriate uh, as a description of the Native Plains people. Uh, but consider this. From Alaska in the north to Tierra del Fuego in the tip of South America, there was tremendous diversity among Native peoples, a wide variety, a bewildering array of cultures from Alaska to South America. And when Europeans arrived in the 1500s, at least 12 major centers of distinctive civilization populated the hemisphere. And contrary to the mythologies of Europeans, Native America was not an untouched wilderness. Look at this illustration here of what one author calls humanized landscapes before 1492, the arrival of Columbus. You can see from the key here the variety of ways that Native peoples engineered or humanized their landscape from husbandry, that is the, uh, the marshalling of animals uh, and plants, uh, to the clearing of forests by fire and grassland by fire for the purposes of, uh, of settlement and, and stimulating agriculture. Agroforestry, that is the planting of crops amidst the trees of forests, uh, irrigation systems, terracing of hillsides, and ultimately the creation of earthworks uh, all across South America, across vast uh, spans of North America and certainly 
here in Mesoamerica and the islands of the Caribbean as well. You know, all of these uh, sort of, uh, you know, um, uh, sort of places uh, from, you know, the great central plains to uh, the jungles of the Yucatan to the desert shores of South America. All these places were in some basic way or, or another not only just populated by native people but re-engineered their landscapes re-engineered for human use by native people. So let's consider the range of native civilizations particularly during the era that we know as the classic era 250 to 900 CE uh, again uh, the, la the late part of this would be a good six centuries before the arrival of Europeans so the classic era of Native American history uh, completely predating the arrival of Europeans by the time Europeans had arrived in the age of Columbus 3,000 years of civilization marked the pre-Columbian history of the Americas and the evidence is all around. From the great earthenworks of the Mississippi uh, Basin, such as the famous Serpent Mound of Ohio, modern Ohio, from tip uh, to tail, the great serpent stretches about 1,330 feet. Here you see its mouth opened, its jaws opened, uh, apparently either uh, about ready to swallow what looks like an oval uh, egg or maybe placing an oval egg through the tip of its coiled tail here. Uh, the largest earthenwork effigy in the world. Effigy simply means uh, a monument made to look like an animal or a person. Uh, it's thought to have been created by the people we know as the Adena somewhere between 900 BCE and 1550 CE. So a broad stretch of time uh, that saw the Adena peoples uh, and their civilization flourish in North America. A very different but still stunning kind of example here is the famous uh, colossal head of the Olmec. Uh, the landscape of, of Mexico, uh, southern Mexico and the Yucatan is dotted with the, uh, the enormous uh, Olmec heads. The Olmec were a people who were established by 1500 BCE in Mexico and whose stonemasons and artists carved these extraordinary heads, extraordinary not just for their size and their engineering. Remember the the rock that was used was quarried sometimes, you know, 50 to 100 miles away from where the heads, many of them weighing between 25 and 50 tons, were eventually located. Uh, but their expressive quality, we can say that this is some of the earliest expressive artistry. And what we mean by that is uh, not just sort of static depictions of a human form but a psychological interpretation of a human being as well with facial expressions that would convey a kind of uh, you know human expression uh, of, of mood of temperament uh, etc so extraordinary artistic creation from North America we see the Mississippi Basin the great artery of the Mississippi River with its many tributaries, the Ohio that comes off the Appalachian watershed, the Missouri River, the Arkansas River that come off the Rockies, feeding the great Mississippi, which then fed a continent. Uh, each of these little squares represents centers of civilization and what we sometimes call the mound building cultures. It was that propensity to create earthenworks like we saw with the Great Serpent Mound. But more often uh, regular uh, geometrical uh, earthen mounds, not effigies, but geometrical patterns like the Great Monk's Mound you see here which is actually an earthen pyramid. These are the ruins of the Monk's Mound Pyramid located near modern St. Louis, Missouri, tied along the banks of the Missouri River. The civilization that we know as Cahokia flourished three centuries before the arrival of Columbus. Here you see the artist's conception of what the central plaza of Cahokia looked like. This is a culture that fed off the great agriculture of the Mississippi Basin and developed trade and commerce 
all along the Mississippi, in fact as far away as the Yucatan and Mexico, bringing artifacts, food crops, and other desired valuables uh, to the uh, to the urban center here at Cahokia. Cahokia was the, the, the most populated city uh, until Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in the 1800s finally eclipsed its, uh, its population size. But actually, uh, the history of habitation goes back long before Cahokia in North America, back to what we call the Ice Age and the Paleolithic or Stone Age. People throughout North America drew upon their local environments for new sources of food, clothing, shelter, and tools. Here you see a, a photograph of some tools that were unearthed in what is now modern Delaware uh, by uh, an archaeological team uh, headed up by uh, a scientist named David Clark. In 2009, archaeologist David Clark unearthed native stone tools, including tools to help make arrows and tools used to crack nuts in present-day Delaware. The artifacts are at least 10,000 years old. We rarely ever find them intact, said Clark. They are such important tools that Native Americans either carried them with them or they were destroyed over time. I've given you the URL here if you're interested in looking more at what David Clark found. Uh, just off, uh, by the way, the, uh, the route of a modern uh, highway in Delaware, highway construction, uh, provided the first opportunity to unearth what were uh, Paleolithic uh, artifacts going all the way back uh, to a period before uh, the end of the last Ice Age. So from ancient North American uh, landscapes and cultures to the extraordinary engineered landscapes of South America. The Great Andes mountain range provides the setting for some of the most remarkable human civilizations in world history. In both the coastal and highland regions of Peru and Chile and Bolivia, great civilizations resided. You've probably heard of the Inca, but the Incas were just the, the, the most recent of these civilizations that coincided with the arrival of, of the Spaniards and the European conquest. Long before Pizarro and the Spaniards, there were other cultures. The Chavin culture, for example, originated at the crossroads of East and West in Peru, developing a distinctive architecture, sculpture, painted textiles, uh, and pottery. So there you see the location of the Chavin uh, along the coastal plains of what uh, is now Peru. drawing lines in the earth to create a landscape of geometry, art, and ritual. Here's an aerial photograph of an extraordinary portrait called The Dog, one of many such landscape drawings of the Nazca, a people who lived along the southern coast of Peru and who created great works of art in the landscape itself, featuring animals such as uh, a monkey, a pelican, a hummingbird, and a and the dog you see here pictured at left. Remember, this is an aerial view. This is a picture drawn from an airplane. This is an enormous portrait uh, that, that, that was essentially created by Native people who uh, removed dark uh, surface stones uh, to reveal uh, and expose the lighter colored uh, earth beneath. And the animal portraits are mixed in with thousands of geometric symbols. Uh, and arrow straight lines, uh, straight edge lines that sometimes extend for many miles and are only completely visible from the air. Uh, this was so extraordinary, it has inspired uh, uh, you know, people ever since to think of it as something almost supernatural, if perhaps extraterrestrial. There was a famous book in the, uh, in the 1970s, enjoyed a, a brief popularity called Chariots of the Gods, in which the author tried to claim that there hadn't been native people that created these portraits, but that they uh, were uh, instead created by uh, arrivals, uh, adventurers, travelers from space, extraterrestrials, in other words. Uh, but there's no evidence to support that, no solid evidence, nothing credible to support that. Uh, all the evidence we need is right there in the ground itself, uh, you know, testifying to uh, the laboring and ingenuity of Native American people. Uh, but, it, but it does raise the question, why have Europeans been so reluctant to acknowledge this obvious fact? 
to give credit, in fact, where credit's due to Native peoples. Uh, well, that's something we're going to be able to talk about as we go through the semester, but as you probably could imagine, the unwillingness to credit Native peoples has something to do with the subsequent conquest and subjugation by Europeans. It made better sense to deny the efficacy of a people you had conquered than to give them credit. Even in places that Europeans regarded as uninhabitable, as primordial wildernesses, in which even today we have to stretch our minds to, to somehow see differently, to, to consider differently, uh, there is evidence that Native peoples engineered these landscapes to support their populations as well. And I'm talking about now, for example, the Amazon Basin of Brazil. Here you see a, a parcelage of the Amazon that has been deforested by modern developers, that is, loggers who have come in and ripped out the trees and, and undergrowth that, that has covered what turn out to be other landscapes, native landscapes, and the fabulous geoglyphs as they're called. That is designs carved right into the rock and the earth. The geoglyphs uh, present in modern day Brazil, in western Brazil, in the region of Acre, show that native peoples engineered landscapes, even in the Amazon rainforest, to suit their needs by clearing trees and building geometrically precise agricultural terraces to produce foods, circles, rectangles and other shapes were actually earthen terraces that were used for agriculture. And it wasn't until developers of the modern age began to change the landscape that evidence of these pre-Columbian landscapes emerged. Native peoples of South America constructed cities in some of the most challenging of natural environments. Centuries before the Inca Empire of Peru, there were the civilizations known as Tiwanaku and Wari, located in western Bolivia and Peru, comprising a network of cities that featured grand architecture and large populations. Tiwanaku and Wari exploited the extreme climate differences of the Pacific Coastal Plain, the Altiplano, or High Plains, and the rugged Andes Mountains to combine a a fishing industry with fruit, vegetable, and grain production from the highlands. Here's a picture showing the Tiwanaku system of raised field agriculture. This was essentially a floodplain, seemingly barren of life, until the Tiwanaku created these raised terraces uh, and used the runoff from the Andes. It's a very arid region. It's no good for rainfall. You can't feed your plants through rainfall. You have to channel the water from the runoff of the Andes and, and channel it they did to create one of the most remarkable agricultural systems in the world. And remarkably, maybe not as remarkable as that of the, the Wari, who cut right into the mountainside, terraced landscapes from the mountainside where crops of vegetables uh, and potatoes and other uh, you know basic elements of what was a a uh, calorie-rich diet for the peoples of the Andes. Extraordinary talent. Between North and South there is the middle. Mesoamerica or Middle America featuring here the great Yucatan Peninsula of southern Mexico and Guatemala. As you probably know there were two great civilizations that dominated Mesoamerica during the Classical Era. The first, the better known of the two, was of course the Maya in modern-day uh, Guatemala and Yucatan, Mexico. The Maya dominated for centuries. And like ancient Mesopotamia or the ancient Greeks, the Mayan civilization was composed of independent city-states that were connected through trade and culture and war leaving behind extraordinary evidence of the sophisticated civilizations that once ruled. Here you see another glyph, a smaller scale carving into rock that featured the written language of the Mayan people. It was long assumed by Europeans that these pictoglyphs were mere symbols of language uh, but what we now know is that they were actual phonetic 
symbols, that is, uh, to be spoken, much like our own uh, alphabet in the recorded language of the Maya. The Maya were city builders, and Tikal was a major urban center of the Maya from roughly 200 to 900 CE, and hosted a population of 50,000 people in the urban core, with another 50,000 the surrounding farms of the countryside, where peasant farmers produced food for the hungry urban masses. Such cities supported craft items, manufacturing, and trade in luxury goods, luxury goods carved from jade and molded from gold and shaped and ornamented with shells and beautiful plumage such as uh, quetzal plumes from exotic birds, uh, not to mention the tasty treat that came from the cacao bean, uh, what uh, we know as the essential ingredient in chocolate. Other cities included the extraordinary Chichen Itza. On the limestone plateau in the northern region of the Yucatan lies the relics of Chichen Itza, one of the most powerful cities of the Maya. The Maya used a great mathematical precision along with celestial or star observations to create monuments such as El Castillo, that's what the Spanish called it, the castle, uh, what the native speakers called the Kukulkan, the Kukulkan Pyramid, which can still be seen at Chichen Itza today. Extraordinary mathematical engineering, precise tolerances to create this amazing edifice of stone. On a smaller scale, but still impressive, you see here the Sampantli, or skull rack, a type of wooden rack or wall that publicly displayed uh, human skulls. You know, we sometimes uh, marvel at the bloodletting and, and seeming, uh, you know, violent tendencies of uh, the Maya people. Uh, but keep in mind now that all civilizations, including our own today, have wedded themselves uh, to the arts of warfare, uh, to the process of, of, of organized killing. Uh, the incarceration of prisoners and the execution of prisoners, uh, for example. So the Maya are no exception uh, to the rule, and because much of the monumental architecture that actually survive uh, bore testament to war and uh, and killing and such, uh, it, it perhaps gets overrepresented in our memory of what uh, of what these cities were about it would be as if all of american civilization perished except for our you know our our masonry and rock and and steel reinforced prisons uh and uh and you know someone happened upon alcatraz island and thus judged the american civilization to have once been a great civilization of incarceration or prison uh building in fact, the very name Alcatraz is an Arab name that means castle, the same way El Castillo means castle. So uh, the similarities are there. Tikal and Chichen Itza were connected by trade, diplomacy, and conquest to the other great civilization, the non Mayan civilization of Mesoamerica, this time farther north in Mexico, known as Teotihuacan. Situated in the central highland valley of Mexico, Teotihuacan was a dominant imperial power during the classical era. Perhaps up to 200,000 lived in the city that the later Aztecs called the City of the Gods, or in the Spanish, the Ciudad de los Dioses. Huge monuments like the Pyramid of the Sun, which you see in the background here, and which we saw in the front slide, uh, and ceremonial temples framed the main boulevards used for parade grounds and military processions. Like ancient Rome, Teotihuacan was the center of an empire with a radius of some 10,000 square miles. All great civilizations require concentrated food production to feed the masses, the urban masses. And at Teotihuacan, an extraordinary engineering took place, human engineering, humanizing of the landscape, if you will. Mesoamerica's ecology of civilization defined the growth of power and culture during the classical era, as in the case of the famous chinampas, or floating gardens agriculture, again in the Valley of Mexico, which supported up to three harvests 
of maize annually. These were built right on the lake, uh, the lakes of Mesoamerica, floating gardens uh, that produced crops of maize and other great uh, food crops, including squash, tomatoes, avocados, guavas, chili peppers, manioc, agave, prickly pear, black raspberries, strawberries, sunflower seeds, and as I mentioned earlier, cacao from which chocolate was made. Even something among the Maya called chicle uh, was, uh, was created, chicle, which became the forerunner of the modern chewing gum industry. You think of chiclets <laughs> as chewing gum, uh, you're talking about a pre-Columbian uh, native specialty. So an almost totally engineered landscape, in the words of historian Robert Strayer, referring to the Maya, they drained swamps, terraced hillsides, flattened ridge tops, and constructed an elaborate water management system. Much of this was in support of a flourishing agriculture, which supported a very rapidly growing and dense population by 750 CE. With a total Mayan population of 5 million or more, the ecology of Mesoamerica depended on food production and available resources. Deforestation and soil erosion combined with a prolonged drought beginning in the 800s to trigger an age of collapse and conflict as cities warred over available resources. We like to shroud this process of decline and fall into stories of mystery and, and perhaps uh, you know, extraterrestrial occurrences, but there's nothing extraterrestrial or even particularly mysterious about why civilizations decline. It almost always had to do with overtaxing of the land, with the exhausting of available resources to support large urban population. Look, when the food runs out or the water runs out, people abandon the cities, making them easy targets for invaders or predators uh, of a human sort as well as the uh, intense pressure of the land itself to reclaim what was once an engineered landscape. You might imagine if New York City were abandoned due to some drought or some cataclysm, uh, natural cataclysm, that within a decade or two decades there would be grass growing in the streets of Manhattan. And so in the Mayan cities of Mesoamerica did the environment eventually reclaim the landscapes that the humans had re-engineered, leaving them to be rediscovered and re-engineered at a later date in our own modern era. Northward from Mexico to an arid river region in our own uh, great southwest, the Four Corners region of Utah, Colorado, New Mexico, and Arizona, we see the evidence not only of great civilization, but once again of engineered landscapes centuries before the arrival of Columbus. 500 years before Columbus's arrival, Native Americans traded precious stones across the American Southwest and Mexico. And that precious stone, most valued, you named it, turquoise, a greenish blue stone colored through geologic processes by copper salts, found in many of the desert regions of the world, including the American Southwest, and throughout history, often treated as precious by the peoples who lived in the desert regions of Persia, China, Egypt, India, and the four corner regions of our Southwest. That's the story we're gonna pick up next time. Focusing on North America, we're gonna set our sights on the engineered landscapes of the land that the Europeans would come to claim that would eventually be the forerunner of our own modern United States of America. So we'll conclude part one of this pre-Columbian America lecture. Uh, you can come back uh, now to part two uh, to follow the story uh, closer to the time 